Our first reading today comes from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, 5 through 6, and 8 through 10, and can be found in your Bibles on page 474. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For the day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. And now we will read Psalm 119 responsively and can be found on page 538. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set for the sun. Which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare the innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. The word of the Lord. Our second reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31, and can be found on page 1139. For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, That would not make it any less a part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which one more presentable parts do you not require? But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. The word of the Lord. This morning will be found in Luke chapter 4, on page 1021. We'll begin with verse 16. Glory to you, o Lord. And he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all who spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were, was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in, this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Just, uh, I missed this this, uh, until this morning as we were reading from the prophet of Nehemiah, where, the, uh, where uh, Ezra was above all the people. And uh, really we we'll recognize this as well. There's a church that was three miles down, a sister church from our church in, in uh, Niagara Falls. And uh, this church was built in the 1850s, I believe, but, and has been very well maintained since that time. But the pastor, to go up to preach, 
had to go up a set of stairs to the, the pulpit, a very ornately uh, carved uh, pulpit with a, with a, 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 actually had a little roof on the pulpit itself. Stunningly beautiful. But yeah, the pastor had to go up and so he was above everybody when he, when he preached. And if you didn't preach from there, you were wrong. Anyhow, we digress. How's that for our bunny trail this morning? This is the day that the Lord has made. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, with our psalmist, we praise God, the glorious creator, as we hear again the opening words of our psalm this morning. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Do we really believe this? Why do we gather together each Lord's Day? And do we gather together with grateful hearts singing, this is the day that the Lord has made? Or do we say, another week, another church service, do I have to go? After all, it's the same thing every Sunday, so really what difference does it make anyway? My question to you this morning is, why do we gather together in the first place? Well, primarily we gather in God's house to hear good news from Jesus. And you heard me correctly. We do not gather to hear about Jesus. We gather to hear from Jesus. We don't gather just to know about Jesus. We gather to know Jesus. We gather to hear of his promises given to us and for us. After all, we live in a world of bad news, don't we? And it's difficult to avoid it most of the time. The news media has made an art of bombarding us constantly with the foulness of human life. It's hatred, it's racism, it's rape, it's theft, it's violence, corruption, murder, just to name a few. These things are nothing new, however, though we do seem to hear about them much more often. Even in my time, though, as a police officer, this years ago now, I encountered people who were literally prisoners in their home. The news, the, 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 the violence around them had kept them barred in their houses for fear. As if the fear of these things weren't enough to darken our days, we still have COVID. As many of you know, Jelaine and I have just been affected by the virus for the second time in our stay here at Trinity. COVID, and to be truthful, our response to it has brought fear and it's brought discord into our world. It's caused division and mistrust among believers and unbelievers alike. In some cases, tearing at the seams of congregations, fraying relationships within the church. But we also experience bad news every day in our personal relationships. We have divorce, where we, we find that God, what God has joined together, man really has decided to tear apart. We hear of diagnosis of cancer in those we love. We have spouses who pass away, leaving us to fend for ourselves. We lose jobs. We lose homes. We have children who stray from the faith. Wearied by the world and worn by our own sinful nature, we come to the right place today. God's house for some good news. We have come to hear the words of Jesus. This is where we find Jesus in our reading this morning from Luke. Luke, Jesus has joined the worshipers at the local church, the synagogue. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom. And he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. It was Jesus' habit from childhood to keep the third commandment. What is the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day? Keep it holy. Jesus' habit is a powerful example for us. Now, worship in Jesus' time followed a pattern much like ours. As is done in our weekly worship, the emphasis of the service was on the reading 
of a part of the scripture, which at that time, remember, consisted of only the Old Testament, and they would read a part from the Law of Moses, that's the first five books, and then they would read from the prophets. This reading would be followed by an explanation of the reading, or a sermon. In our reading, Jesus is called upon to read from the prophets that day. Now, any man from the synagogue was allowed to read from the scriptures during the service. And Jesus had been brought up in Nazareth, and likely in this congregation. And so he had returned for a visit, and therefore he was not an unknown. He was a local boy who had done well. And Jesus was acclaimed as a leader and a miracle worker in Capernaum, as we read in verse 23. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. We, what we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Yes, Jesus was known. In fact, he was well known to this congregation, and he was welcomed to read the scriptures among them. Now, the scripture readings in Jesus' time followed a sort of a lectionary reading, not unlike what we follow today. The lectionary is a standardized list where we get our scripture readings each week. These are not pulled from random. We go through a three-year lectionary, which allows us to get through the Bible in three years. The scriptures read that day proclaimed the message of God's good news for the people. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus, and he selected the specific reading from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. These words were originally spoken by Isaiah to the Israelites who were facing captivity. Yet these words were words of, of good news to them, speaking of God's pardon, the words that lifted the people up. And this good news is, it's headline good news. It's about a spiritual reconstruction. It's good news, not for the self-righteous, not for those who feel that they're entitled to God's favor because of anything that they might have done or because of their heritage. But it is for the spiritually poor, those who are captives to their sin, the spiritually blind, and those who are oppressed by the burden of their sins. This sounds a lot like our generation today, doesn't it? Blindly pursuing materialistic goals, captive to self-satisfying sins of the flesh, and blind to the light of God's love for us. This message from Isaiah is above all about the Messiah. It is of the Messiah, that long-promised deliverer of the Jewish people who would come and deliver God's people from their sins, and which is summarized in verse 19 of our reading, uh, which is the, called the year of Jubilee. The, that's the year where everything returns to its rightful honor. People are reunited with God. After Jesus finished reading, he sat down on the platform to give his sermon or his explanation. And there was a hushed silence of expectation. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, we read. And then Jesus shocks the world with the good news that he is the Messiah. Jesus says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus shocks the people of Nazareth when he fulfills the scriptures. I mean, just think about these words of Jesus. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What Jesus says is that the words of the prophet Isaiah, words written 700 years before Jesus reads them, were about him. They were given by him to the prophet Isaiah in the first place. These words of God to the prophet Isaiah step off the scroll in the person of the word of God, right in the presence of those Sabbath day worshipers. Can you imagine the response? This hometown boy returns to church as a guest, and he claims that Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Messiah is now come true. In the person of Jesus, 
the reader of the lesson for that day. Matthew records the people's response best, I think, in his gospel. Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did all this man get all of this? And they took offense at him. They did not hear the good news. Jesus not only brings good news, he is the good news of God for every sinner. For each of us who feels the weight of our sin, each of us who has been struggling to find God on our own and has failed again and again, Jesus says to you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For each of us who has longed to know eternal life, Jesus steps off the pages of Scripture this morning and says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Even today, Jesus is clearly revealed to you and me in the words of John. 1 John chapter 5, God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Jesus is revealed again and again in the scriptures. We celebrate Jesus' virgin birth, also prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In the scriptures we read of how God has anointed Jesus to proclaim good news of God's forgiving, restoring love. Acts 10.38 tells us of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we read repeatedly how Jesus' ministry was carried out that the scripture, that is the Old Testament laws, might be fulfilled. In the scripture we see Jesus as the the suffering servant of whom Isaiah wrote and whom God punished for all of our sins, all of our sins, past, present, future. Isaiah writes of Jesus, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. All have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus' sermon is shocking to these people. It's like saying, yes, I, the person you see before you, am the Messiah that God promised. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The people who heard the good news that Sabbath day, they reject the message of that long-awaited Messiah who has come to their worship service that morning. Our expected response might be for, for all of us to throw up our hands and say, praise the Lord, we're free. Instead, the first reaction was split. Initially, as we read in verse 22, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. They marveled at the way or the manner he spoke of God's love of rescue and rescue for them. And then, just as quickly, the devil quickly plants doubt. He said, don't forget, this is Joseph's son. Messiah? Eh, I doubt it. And then human nature takes over and the people are essentially thinking, prove it to us. Prove that you are the Messiah. And finally, doubt turns to outright rejection. They didn't buy it. 
They could not accept the words of the Son of God. They just cannot believe that this hometown boy could be the promised one of God. He, he's from right here among us. How can this be? His family is still here. How can this be? He's no expert on the things of God. Bunny trail. Who can tell me what an expert is? Anybody? Expert is somebody who's more than 50 miles from home, has no responsibility for implementing the advice he gives, and shows slides. <laughs> In the eyes of the congregation at this synagogue, Jesus has grown up among them. He is local. How could he claim to be the Messiah, the expert at God's word? Finally, in this morning's reading, Jesus gives a warning. The good news may be taken from them and given to others. Jesus cites the example of the prophet Elijah, aiding not the widows of Israel. There were many widows of, 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 in Israel during that great famine, but only the widow of Zarephath. And then he cites the example of Elisha, healing not the lepers of the land of Israel. And there were many of them at that time, but instead healing the Syrian commander, Naaman. In other words, if the people of Israel reject the good news, the Gentiles were still waiting to hear it. The promise of God would be taken away from the people of Israel and given to others. And it has. To you and to me, the crowd rises up in anger, and they rise up in unison, and they mob Jesus, trying to kill him by throwing him off the cliff. How dare he say that the good news is for the Gentiles as well. Yet Jesus walks right through their midst, for they have no power over the Messiah. What is today's response to the shocking good news that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture? What if Jesus himself were to step up in the pulpit this morning and preach this good news to you? He does, you know. Jesus is present not only here at Trinity, but in every church which proclaims the forgiveness of sin, salvation, and life eternal which is found in Christ alone. Jesus comes to us in word and sacrament each week as his, his custom. Even today, when Jesus revealed some reject the good news to their destruction. They continue to deny prophecy and fulfillment, especially about Jesus as the Messiah. See, they want to be their own problem solver, saying to themselves, surely there must be some other way than the cross. But the good news is that there is no other way but through the cross of Christ. And it's not up to you to come to this faith. It is God, the Holy Spirit, who creates this faith in your heart through the word of good news. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. When Christ reveals himself in his word, by faith, you see Jesus' mission completed. In Bethlehem, Calvary, resurrection and ascension for you. By faith, you search the scriptures by daily Bible reading. They, they testify of Jesus and of his love for you. And by faith, you believe in him and come to trust Jesus as your personal savior. So this brothers and sisters, is why we gather to worship. We gather so that we can hear the words from Jesus. We gather so that we can hear that for Jesus' sake, your sins have been forgiven. We join together so that we can hear the promises of Jesus, promises of salvation and life eternal. We gather together as Jesus comes to us personally. He comes to us and reveals to us personally in the body and blood of communion this morning. Jesus comes to us during this time of worship. We read in Peter, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. In Jesus' name.
Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.